or how do they fit within that and, and that criteria. So <coughs> perhaps there's an opportunity to create a similar uh, framework but for a commercial slash or non-commercial uh, activity or less commercial activity. You know what I'm trying to say? Um, less of value. Could that be a DA consent condition then? Well, there's probably, there's, there's, um, for the affordable housing, there's an act and there's operating requirements, business plans that community housing providers have to have, they have to be licensed, so there's a, there's a framework that supports that. Um, it's, it's not necessarily something that's delivered and monitored through the planning system. But you know, there's an opportunity here to create something. Well, how, how, with the creation of this opportunity, that like, like the city works. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Which is mm. like the major model. Yep. Yes. That process, and that won't become commercial. No, it won't. But I suppose if you if you took the objectives mm. and the you outcomes. Go and sign off on that. Um, yes, you well, may, maybe it's. You know the minister for trade and innovation, or you know, there's. It, it's about securing some of those uses that can't compete, those commercial activities that can't compete in a very uh, high demand, commercially driven city. So hey, we've got just... we've got that diversity outcome. Because urban growth won't look at putting any of the heritage or open space or anything in this contract. So, uh, you know. The, the response there is that you know, in, a, in a commercial environment, you're right, you have less ability to apply, to apply pressure. So, at this point, what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify things that we can do to, to make that more effective, the pressure that we can apply. So, at this point, you know, with regards to the heritage, we'll be making very strong representations to the relevant ministers and to urban growth about how we think they should manage the heritage of the site going forward. About the legal mechanisms and the other assurances that can be put in place to secure that. Mm. And that links in really nicely with. And one of the out. problems I, I, I foresee is that more recently, last year, you guys put through your employment plans, whatever it's called. Yep. And in that, I don't know whether you were there, but I spoke and raised the issue, contrary to the developers, um, that it allows affordable housing as an incentive in those areas. And I can see the financial model why you do that. But the problem is, is then you have in these employment lands, which is, I guess, similar to this, is, is that you then, and this is for South of Sydney, for South of Sydney in kind of growing areas, um, that you actually then have affordable housing segregated from normal residential areas and you have them in the commercial areas. So you come back to the segregation of housing. Mm. And whilst my question was not responded to very well last year. I want to understand why are you guys doing it? I know there's a financial implicate that yeah. it's attracted to the... But isn't it always that you don't want to segregate affordable housing away from residential <coughs> areas, that you actually want to make sure that it's part and parcel so of a normal suburban area? That's... The, Jeanette, I might take that question... Yeah. Because I'm just off, worried about that coming on. Offline ...because <laughs> yeah. there's a couple of things that are at play there, and. I'm quite happy to go yeah. into detail about that. I'm, I was just concerned because I'm seeing that that could happen on this site, potentially. I, yeah, okay. Okay. very, very different. Can I just come back to the sort of the question about how, how council uh, put some, some pressure on in terms of the heritage stuff? Um, one of the things that we tried to do following on from the, um, from the um, Red Club Water Heritage Task Force was to the recommendation of that was that there be an ongoing mechanism across the site. Um, yeah. And we tried to get uh, SMBA to uh, pick it up, and they didn't. Um, and there's a, 
a motion on council's books that says if the council can't talk the minister into it, then the council will use its good offices to try and um, bring together people across the site with a view to try and to set some mechanism up. Mm. And I'm just wondering whether or not that might play also a role in this over the next few months in terms of there being a, uh, a mechanism that brings some heritage people together to look at uh, how things might happen across the, across the site. Because we're not just talking in terms of heritage interpretation about the Australian technology park. There's North Everly and there's the other sort of precincts um, around that. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be a way of sort of trying to leverage out this whole idea of how you actually uh, you know, make some provisions for heritage uh, across the site like this. The problem we ran into with the city is the city doesn't really have any precincts that sort of fit into that heritage uh, thing, partly because you've got you know, Sydney Harbour Foreshore basically handle the, the rock sort of thing, so there wasn't a mechanism that already pre-existed. So I'm just interested to know whether or not you see something like that as having some role knowing that that is on the books of council. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff, I, I, I'm I don't think it's explored as part of this response and I think um, all the work that Hill PDA did for us. Um, you're quite right about the barriers and challenges of council putting something in place. I think what we've tried to emphasise through this work is some, I suppose, assurances, legal mechanisms, um, things that we can put in place of substance that have some remedy um, to secure the outcomes that we're after. So that uh, resolution on the books about perhaps stepping in where SMDA or Urban Growth now have chosen not to step in to broker uh, some sort of relationship, an ongoing sort of commitment to um, make sure that the heritage themes and uh, values are, are kept in place or sustained, um, that, that can still be up to council to run through, but um, I think it would be very much a, a cooperative and uh, discretionary, it would be, we'd be cajoling, we'd, we'd be stepping in, ha having meetings, asking people to volunteer time, uh, resources perhaps, if it's a new owner, would it be access, uh, things like that. So that's that's not discounted, but I think, uh, again, what we're trying to do is, is secure outcomes. So if there's an obligation um, to, you know, if we can get an obligation in there to make the heritage fabric accessible to the public within hours, within certain hours, reasonable hours, then that's something that is probably, you know, in terms of informing the sale, any sort of sale process that goes through, that's, that's what we're concentrating on. So I guess, just to follow that through, how would you, what, what could you possibly do to the title or to the sale that would mean that people could get access through uh, the locomotive workshops, for example, to access uh, the heritage equipment? Because the, because the issue is, is hey, what you can put in place that actually is going to pass on to the owner and then on to the next owner. Yeah. Look, the, the exact legal mechanism, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure of. I think what's important is to make sure that that obligation is, is put into the sale documents so that when the title is, the title documents are prepared for the transfer, it's, it's secured in some way. Now it might be an easement, it might be a right of way, whatever the, the, the exact legal terminology is, I, 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 can't, I can't tell you exactly what well, it is. There are different types of covenants and easements that we yeah. on over the, um, the Conveyancing Act. And we tend to use them quite imaginatively sometimes yeah. in the city. We've used them to, you know, well, we have authority, we've been able to use them to restrict the height of buildings at Circular Cape, for instance, um, to restrict Certain, this, um, certain buildings and certain types of uses where we're keen on keeping commercial uses from mm -hmm. And to a certain size. And to a certain size. So there's definitely room in there to mm -hmm. craft some kind of legal yeah. thing that protects. So the challenge is persuading the road to take that on. Yeah. 
No, that's, that's not, not that there's an absence of a mechanism, but the challenge is persuasion. Yeah. Um, the tough one. That's what we're at. Mm -hmm. um, just to add on to what Jeff was saying, and I don't know whether you know, you're aware of it as a council, the state government set up Sylmia as a, um, a, a heritage rail museum and maintenance facility, and that was a $50 million disaster owing to the fact of its location and also all sorts of things, not bad lifting capacity, all that sort of thing. So they're now moving it back to the erecting shop from 38 to 1 is you know, going to be maintained there and it's, uh, the whole emphasis now is looking at the erecting shop, which is the other shed from the locomotive shop further down, which isn't part of the sale. But it just does show that this is, this is the state government who is actually now realising the importance of this area as a heritage site and the fact that it is, a, it is still active and can actually maintain steam locomotives for the tourist industry. And which also ties in the blacksmithing shop, which is still active, which will sort of can play a part with that whole, mm -hmm. that whole site. So, you know, on in, in one hand, they're sort of looking at it as for what it can offer on a heritage level, but they're completely um, forgetting about the fact that they're actually in the middle of selling it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. excited by the fact that it's going to be X amount of dollars to Treasury. Isn't yeah. that a problem? Well, obviously, there's different departments too. Yeah. That's, that's, that's <laughs> the thing. Yeah, they're not. Is it Treasury that leads the charge these people days? With different objectives. Yes. And, yeah. But it's worth knowing and considering yeah. this, this fact that the state government is, yeah. you know, turning its, its, its <coughs> vision back onto the site. Sort of well, it's probably also worthwhile just recognising that in fact that building was zoned originally by the RWA for a 12-storey building because the building that was there was you know, going to fall down. Um, and that was one of the things that we actually fight and won against the, the RWA. And one of the last things they did was actually to return the zone, the, the zoning, or well, make the zone compatible with heritage uh, rail use and to bring the uh, height down to the existing height. So, well, the ones that this indicates that sometimes you can win. Sorry? How does central wibbly impact that? Sorry? How does central wibbly impact that? Well, it's, it's outside the area that central wibbly is dealing with. It's actually not within the area that specifically... It's part of the site, though, but it's not the site. Yeah. It's up the site. Oh. OK, so we've, we've gone through quite a few issues there. We've talked about heritage, access, and links, and, and I suppose one other point we, we make to council is, you know, if there is hopefully a redevelopment of the Redfern station and improved linkage between the ATP site and the station, then leaving particularly the public domain in public hands so that it can be used to facilitate improved access, um, or, or you know. A, access point across the railway line. Um, it doesn't make sense to introduce another owner to then negotiate and you know challenge. So that's a concern for us. Um, issues about governance and community, some of the the assurances that we have in place, the uh, operating constitution or uh, as it is for the ATP for all those commercial uses, um, uh, the technology, providing jobs for locals, how does that come through, the strategic <coughs> planning, so what are the planning controls that are in place, the built form, and the economic benefits that flow from local jobs and, and those sort of things. So they're the main issues that the report deals with. Um, does anyone have, have any more questions? specifically about any issues. Sorry, I do. Um, in this report, which is the, the document for EOI, yep. it says it's a, a 44,000 square metres of livable area. Is that because when you mentioned the 100,000 capacity currently, oh, sorry, current controls have currently 100,000 square uh, gross floor area. Yep. Is that because What's the difference between 44 and 100? Is that because it hasn't been built? Because well, I thought you had capacity for another 100 and I've always got capacity for 200 under the current controls. I'm not sure if that's the sale brochure for the full site or the registration. This is the sale brochure for 
Um, and it just says 44,000. That's what took, that's why I got confused on. Um, it's a celebration for this expression of interest. And it just has a breakup. It mentions it quite a few times. The document, right? It has a, it has a net letable area of forty-four thousand. Is there a date on well, the front? <coughs> yeah, Jeanette? it's expression of interest for two thousand and fifteen, January thirtieth, January. Yep. Yeah. So it might be referring to the buildings that have existing leases that yeah. aren't being sold as such, but uh, their long-term leaseholders being sold. So those are the buildings like the Global TV Channel Seven, Nicta. Yeah. But have but existing eight, long term. Nine, 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 oh, no, sorry, Nicta doesn't have a long term lease. Um, okay, so the, the only ones that have got long term leases are the National Innovation Centre, which is the yeah. one that won the international prize, and Media City. And they're, they're, they are on 99 year leases at a very right. low initial upfront payment, yeah. going through right to 2094. So well, they're secure. But Nicta, um, which is one that I wanted to raise, mm. Uh, is not secure, and uh, the, the whole building is in the sale. Yeah. Its, it's funding has been withdrawn by the Abbott government. It's recurrent funding. It just it, it evaporates at the end of um, June this year, mm -hmm. uh, which actually also... Um, um, sorry, I think it's 2016. I could be mistaken. But it, it's the same time that their lease then comes up for negotiation. They have an option to continue on. But it's, it's quite likely that a group like NICTA, which are, yeah, really are a leading research organisation in Australia on, on information communications technology, will be turfed out. Mm -hmm. They currently pay in excess of $5 million in rent, when you look at the, the detailed revenues that go to the ATP organisation. I think with a combination of a private owner looking for more rent and not having a, a cash flow uh, from the Abbott Govern as a result of their budget last year, they're, they're in real prospect of having to be getting the removal trucks in to move out mm -hmm. and some other owner taking over. So I guess a bit of a build-up, but my, my question, and, and don't mistake me, I, I favour what the City of Sydney is doing here. <laughs> so, um, but did you actually talk to any of the existing tenants that are not on that 99-year lease arrangement? throughout the whole of the site, to ask them what they thought about prospects we, under, a, we, under a private owner. We understood that they all thought it was a risk. We don't underestimate yeah. that they do think it is a risk. Yeah, OK. But you didn't actually have a direct conversation with Nick Tour or any of the others? The timing didn't allow it. Yeah, all right. Right before Christmas. Yeah. I'm not saying you necessarily should have. I just yeah. you just didn't know whether that was the case. There's more of desktop. But Nectar particularly is at high risk. It, I, I believe it will evaporate as, a, as an organisation in, in this uh, precinct. All the uh, permanent come, um, come, leases uh, had to sign a document that they consented to the subdivision, which is what this was when this all kicked off in November. So I would be very interested to know, for the council, did everyone sign? That consent, we didn't. This is Blacksmiths, and we uh, right. we had a lot of pressure put on us, an awful lot of pressure from Urban Growth to sign that document. <laughs> <laughs> or, but when we said, well, we might consider it if we get an extension on the license for the blacksmithing shop, so we know it's protected. Yes, something, yeah. something reasonable. Yeah. But they wouldn't grant us that, so we would not sign it, and um, consequently, they're not talking to us anymore. <laughs> that's probably a good thing. <laughs> yes, that's a two Well, oh, that's something. We don't, I can follow that up for you. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, well, I'd really like to know how many tenants actually did sign that because they were saying we were the only ones that didn't, but I don't agree. And I don't even know why we had to sign it anyway. What difference did it make anyway? They still mm. went ahead. Probably so it looked a little better. Not sure. I'm not sure I'd be not very sure. well, to know sure. if you don't sign it, what, 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 what happens to them if they don't sign it? Well, it has been argued that... No, because it was a council. Well, it has been argued that if the existing leases didn't sign, technically the subdivision couldn't have gone ahead. Yeah, I'm not too sure what the legal obligation is for a subdivision application. Um, for example, if you want to put in a DA, you've got to get landowners' consent. That's right. 
um, whether that but, but not a leaseholder's not a, consent. Not a leaseholder's yeah. consent. So I'll just yeah. check. We, we can just check it to a different set of requirements for that. And I might it might have been the nature of the lease or, it might not be or something like that. that. that Um, given all of the risks of this sale um, and all of those issues identified and the, um, the unpopularity at the moment um, with the whole privatisation agenda of state government and electricity poles and wires and so on, <clears throat> rather than the city take the stand that, oh, this is a bit risky and they've got all these issues, why don't they take the stand, look, no, we, 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 we reject the sale of this site altogether. Mm. Why not take that stronger stand? Is that something that... Council have themselves taken that stance, that they don't support the sale. But the role of this report is to say, and this is what we were asked to do, if the sale does go ahead, what are the risks? And how do we manage those risks? Um, in terms of us standing up and saying... You know, we object to the sale. I'm not sure how much impact that would have. I think, I think so unfortunately, the... Andrew, it's probably less emotive than the sale of the poles and wires. Mm. Just as I think there's every chance they'll sell those beautiful buildings in Bridge Street that belong to the Department of Education mm. and others. You know, I think people care less about that because it won't impact me. They'll, mm. But mm -hmm. start talking about the sale of poles and wires and whether or not you believe that the price of electricity will increase, now it starts to hurt me. But sorry, but you've got, I'm also looking at the Solar Powerhouse Museum. This is, a, mm. this is just symptomatic of this government. It, it wants to sell mm. assets like this mm. for private development interests. Mm. So it, 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 fits, it fits in a broader statewide process that a lot of people are saying it's actually aligned with the, the process around the sale of the poles and wires as well. Mm -hmm. It's the same mentality. Mm -hmm. Turn whatever public assets you, you've got yeah. for a benefit to the community That's a philosophy. and hand it to a developer to make money out. Mm -hmm. but, and, and what we're trying to capture here is how do we maintain... What, what are the opportunities to maintain the public interest as it moves into private hands? There's some opportunities to do that here. And that's the argument that we'll be putting forward, and I think that's important. If you're given the opportunity to contribute to uh, and feedback to urban growth, then that's your opportunity to say, well, jobs are important here, high tech, um, innovation, um, that's important, uh, lower rent commercial spaces, that's important. There are examples. Um, and, and legal mechanisms that should be put into the sale documents and an obligation carried through to private owner. Public access, that's important. There's legal ways of securing that. So th this is the flavour of, of this. With the, Yes, we prefer it not to happen because we can, we can be much surer about the public interest being maintained while ever it's a publicly owned um, piece of land. But how do we try and secure some of that? So just, just on a bit of detail, you said that this hasn't been dealt with by council yet. But, I mean, I've read the mayoral minute, and it's to be dealt with next week, is that? No, what I heard? The, it was dealt with last week. Last week. Yeah, last Monday. And what was the outcome of that? What was it decided? Um, council supported the contents of the report, and council requested that we um, write to the relevant ministers and to the group and circulate the report within those bodies and make representations based on the contents of the report. And on the same meeting, the uh, West Connex uh, SGS report came out, yeah. um, and there's a similar mayoral minute. I mean, there's a lot of symmetry between those two in that meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the recommendation um, in the case of the West Connex one is, like, reconsider West Connex and do this other thing. Whereas on the ATP one, it's more like, well, it's risky, isn't it? And that's all. It's not like, it's not like this is really risky and bad, don't do it. Why, why don't they have that bit stronger? I mean, you're saying we don't sure how much influence we'd have, but um, if you're saying you can have some influence on a massive $15 billion project like West Connex, and there's, you know, why not, 
you know, just take that similar strong, bit stronger stance on. I think the risks that. would still be in place, whether it was government owned or privately owned, if the government is aligned to try to generate more revenue from the site. So again, what we've tried to do is find, you know, fight the battle that we think we can win, which is about influencing the way the sale is handled and the way that the public interest is currently enjoyed in the site can be maintained. But I just think that if the government held on to the site, they wanted to do those things, they would still do them. Yeah. Just, just, just if the government did hold on to that site, you know, because it's such a well-placed site, could it not, and say rather than selling it and still have the upside of the site, could it not also have a good income base? And really, or, or is that just too politically not nice? So it really needs to offer. I mean, our base position is that the site should be held. Yeah. That the site has great attributes, and that it has the potential to contribute to some things that haven't happened yet, you know, <coughs> in the future, yeah. that we haven't quite got there. Mm -hmm. So we still think the site should be held on to. What was the second part of your question? Why, why can't they just make... Yeah, like they're justified yeah, not to sell the yeah, poles and wires because of the ongoing that's income. A treasury, that's why a not? question for Treasury. Just to bring in a quick catch. It isn't a, yeah. That's a question right. for Treasury. Yeah. I think, yeah. my, the way I imagine it is that Treasury sees that and the best way to get income hits is to sell things off, build infrastructure, take the revenue. That's, that's how I see it. But that's a, you know, that's a government, a state government decision. Well, but that's the... A lot of people have heard my idea. I still have a dream for that site. In Grenoble, they have redeveloped the city and they have this incredible city, which is now the European research hub, but it's an international hub, it's just yeah. amazing. And it's not the ATP per se, it's on steroids kind of concept. So it's a kind of ATP for <coughs> Australia, South Pacific, you know, research centre. And then that generates incredible capacity and income and research findings and so they have 16,000 research scientists mm -hmm. in Grenoble and they're extending there's, it further. There's Why couldn't we do something like that with them? Where, where cities, um, you know, where they've had to work really hard to develop employment hubs, where they're targeted industries, <coughs> where they're competitive in, and it's really not just about selling it off, it's about providing not only infrastructure but... Jobs of the future. Yep, jobs of the future in the industries of the future where, where we can so, um, so that was the original purpose. Along with Rail Heritage. Can I go to say too that I mean this is a site that Angela Merkel came and visited. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we're saying, oh that's interesting, we're now going to sell it. I mean she came because she saw it as a model yeah. of public private partnership around innovation mm -hmm. and job generation and, and the industries of the, the century. Um, and this is the original mission. In fact, if you go down to the corner of um, Mitchell Road and Henderson Road, there's a sign posting there about the site, and it says innovation, sustainability community. Um, you might as well get the bulldozer in and knock that over once the ownership changes. Sure. It, won't, so it won't actually be an Australian technology park. No, no, it'll be... Yeah. It'll be <laughs> It'll be some it's hotel be, uh, it'll be precinct be, with these other the agents. Waterloo Business Park. Uh, precisely. Um, yes, but the federal government was so pissed off with Angela Merkel going to the building. Of course. They uh, forced the CEO, yeah. Hugh Durrant White, you know, uh, who is one of our top scientists. I've seen all that. I agree entirely. Why? Because he, he embarrassed because them. He embarrassed <laughs> the federal government. Because <laughs> the Abbott government had cut the funding for NICTA, particularly, off right. during the, right. as part of the last year's budget. So, you know, I think that there's a, a legitimate um, future for this site, um, which is... Should we approach the German heritage? government and ask them that they would like to actually purchase the site <laughs> and think about something long term <laughs> in terms of development with Australia supported by the community rather than the government? Well, I, I agree. Yeah. It's, a, it's a part of a strategy. Think but, big. <laughs> but there, there is legitimacy in arguing for the site to be maintained as it was established. Right. Sure. We're not a resources country anymore. It, it's, it's, a, it's a site for rail tourism, and, and there's a very interesting report done um, by, by the O'Farrell government initially, but tabled with the Ed government, um, about the future of rail heritage in the state. Mm -hmm. 
And, and the point made about Thermal is right. It, it was done by a Labor government, a complete white elephant, money wasted. The process could be brought back into the centre of Sydney as a... As